Betrayal on the home front. I wish I had known about these boards when I discovered my wife, now ex, was having an affair while I was on my last deployment to Afghanistan. Not that I would wish the experience on anybody, but hearing from others who have had similar situations and knowing that I'm not alone in experiencing the rage and anguish, even years afterwards, has been beneficial. So here's my two cents. Despite the fact that all of our regular bills had been set to auto-pay prior to my deployment, I would periodically log in and check balances to ensure that everything was tracking and being paid as it should. Money wasn't a problem, but I knew that with my wife's hard work on a nearby military installation and several children to care for, something would slip through the gaps. I opened the visa slash debit card on a whim and began scrolling through the transaction history. The transactions were generally normal, with a few too many meals out, but being the parent handling things with a deployed spouse is difficult, so I didn't say anything. Then I spotted a transaction that took me by surprise. A flight to a tourist attraction on the opposite side of the country. Despite the fact that I had approximately six months remaining on my deployment, the trip was booked for the next month. The purchase had already been completed many weeks before. I attempted to think of a plausible explanation why my wife would book the flight without informing me. It couldn't have been a professional trip, not just because of the location, but also because government travel prohibits you from using your personal credit card. During our next Skype call, when the kids were out of earshot, I casually mentioned the plane ticket and inquired about it with my wife. She paused and inquired as to how I heard about it. She never used internet banking and seems to be ignorant of the quantity of data provided. She immediately recovered and informed me that the burden of dealing with the kids on her alone had prompted her to accept an offer to a girl's mental wellness retreat with some of her female CO workers. I told her I knew how stressed she was. However, it seems that flying across the nation and leaving your children at home without another parent is something we would have addressed before you bought the airline ticket. Then I asked her who would be looking after the kids while she was gone for a week. She replied that a 16-year-old neighbor girl would be minding our children, all of whom were still in diapers. I answered that if there was no responsible adult in the home caring for the children, I would contact Child Protective Services myself. As a result, she promptly agreed to have her mother drive over and babysit the kids. Of course, the reason she would be so foolish as to hire a kid to look after our children for a week was because her mother or any other adult may inquire about the trip. She told her mother and the kids it was a work trip, but after I found out, she couldn't use that excuse with me since as a service member and therefore a government employee myself, I would have seen straight through that lie, thus the girl's retreat line. I partly anticipated her to cancel the trip if it wasn't authentic, since who in their right mind would go on an affair vacation after their husband found the tickets? But, whether it was because she felt obligated to tell her tale or because she wanted it so badly she rationalized that she wouldn't be caught, she boarded the aircraft. When I couldn't contact my wife the day before the trip, I phoned my mother-in-law to see how the kids were doing, and she informed me that my wife had departed earlier in the day to spend the night at a hotel near the airport. We had flown out of that airport many times on vacation and had never had any trouble driving the 50 miles the morning of the flight. In addition, no hotel fee occurred for that night. I also kept expecting for any hotel charges to emerge at the destination, but they never did, despite the fact that she had been there for a week. This particular tourist area is well known for its high prices, yet I only noticed two charges on my wife's credit card throughout the course of the week. I could see from the transactions that she was in the location she claimed to be going to, but how she managed to eat for a week and see the attractions without spending any money was a mystery. She never attempted to contact me by phone or email during her so-called retreat, despite the fact that I had an Afghan mobile phone and reasonably frequent access to email and the internet. I requested her to email me photos of herself and her pals. I explained that seeing her having fun and recharging her batteries would be beneficial to me. Surprisingly, she didn't have a single photograph from her week in a tourist hotspot. While she was on her way, I went to a spot with internet connection and began analyzing phone records. I discovered one number to which she was making and receiving calls often throughout the day, even in the middle of the night. The phone conversations would often last more than an hour. And these phone calls began not when I was in Afghanistan, but while I was prepping for the deployment in another state for a couple of months. Because there was just a weekend back at home between training and deployment, I was effectively on the deployment. I decided I'd given her enough rope, so I began pressuring her for the names of her friends who had joined her on the trip. When she informed me that every one of her friends had backed out of the trip except one, I knew she was worried. She was attempting to make her narrative more understandable. She offered me one name but refused to provide me the woman's last name or the department in which she allegedly worked. I then said that we would return to the identity of the lady who allegedly accompanied her on the trip, but that we really wanted to review these phone records first. 
I provided her the name with which the phone number was linked, turns out that was her affair partner's father. Then I said that from the time I started my pre-deployment training until now, she had been contacting this man 10 to 20 times each day. The only exception was that there were no calls to or from that number after she departed for the alleged hotel the night before her trip, and there were no calls to or from that number during her retreat. Furthermore, the calls only resumed at the time she would have been driving home from the airport after her return flight. I told her I thought it was strange that someone she couldn't stop talking to at least 10 times a day for a year simply dropped off her phone log the night before her flight while she was supposedly in a hotel near the airport, and then resumed like clockwork about an hour and a half after her return flight landed. I had to cut the conversation short, but by the time we talked again, I had established with a buddy at that command that there was no lady with that name at her command. I told her that I had confirmation that the lady she claimed to have been to the destination with was a sham and that we had previously proven that the guy with the mysterious phone in his pocket was on that journey with her. She later revealed that it was a male employee, but she said that everyone else had backed out on her and that it was just by coincidence that this person, whom she had been contacting numerous times a day for a year, was the one on the aircraft with her. However, she was unable to produce a single name of someone who could support the narrative that they had initially planned to go on the trip. Finally, she acknowledged that she had never gone anywhere with anybody other than this man, due to her failure to provide a hotel bill or demonstrate any hotel activity on her credit card. She was forced to concede that she shared a room with him, although she claimed it was a suite. Just two pals splitting the costs. I pointed out that based on the phone records, this same individual may have saved you money on a hotel the night before the trip as well. I informed her that she was a liar and a cheat, and that I want a divorce. She suddenly began sobbing as though she had just heard horrible news on Judgment Day. She then enlisted the help of the kids, forcing them to hold the camera so I could see her lying splayed out on the kitchen floor weeping and pleading with me not to leave her. I didn't finish the call because I didn't want to talk about it in front of the kids. For the rest of the deployment, I would interrogate her simply to see her squirm and say as many falsehoods as I could catch her in. When I finally returned from deployment and took a cab to the house to pick up some clothes and uniforms, she tried to sleep with me because she knew that if she convinced me to sleep with her, it would reset the clock on the 12-month divorce waiting period in our state, which had been running since I emailed her six months ago that we were separated pending divorce. I informed her that even though I'd been in Afghanistan for a year, I wasn't in that much of a hurry. She asked me if there was anything she could do to make me reconsider not divorcing her after another week of begging and pleading. She offered a one-sided open marriage so I could exact my retribution, and she offered to remain in a marriage since I promised her I would never touch her again. I told her it was a long chance, but if she was absolutely honest, she should answer every question, no matter how explicit. Then I may think about it. She began telling me about how they met and the first time they up, but it wasn't long before I saw discrepancies and evident falsehoods in her account. She was definitely lying in order to reduce her guilt. I didn't say anything at the time because I wanted to hear her explain everything before I began ripping it apart. When I was leaving for the hotel that evening, I asked her whether she had cut off all communication with the affair partner, and she answered she could if I really wanted her to. I informed her that a normal person would not have said that, but I really wanted her to, and she agreed. When she believed I was halfway to New York with the kids four days later, I discovered on the locator app on our phones that she was in a restaurant in a nearby city. Because she believed I was out of town, I waited until the tracker showed her back at home, then walked in on her and her affair partner in our bedroom. Because there was just her vehicle in our driveway, they either drove her car from a restaurant nearly an hour away or parked his in a covert area where the neighbors would not see. The AP fled, but my son said isn't that Tom? Not his actual name, and it was only then that I confirmed the man fleeing down the street. Was the affair's companion. That's also when I discovered my kids didn't just recognize him, they knew him by first name. My wife attempted to explain that he had just driven down an hour and a half from where he lives to see the new bathroom light fixture. She was definitely furious and eventually sneaked by me, went in her vehicle, and drove away for approximately 20 minutes. My hypothesis is that she picked up her affair companion down the block and drove him about a mile to a shopping center where his vehicle was most likely concealed. I could go on and on about the many falsehoods she said over the next several days and months. However, we discovered via the Guardian ad litem in the custody battle that the affair partner had been literally living at our home. The kids had been picked up from school and daycare by the AP. AP, my then wife, and the kids went on family trips. This man would sometimes take my kids out without my wife. My kid once walked in on him while he was in the shower in his mother's bedroom. After I was granted full custody, I relocated the children to another city. I try to be courteous and cooperative as a parent, but it's not always easy. 
My ex-wife attempted to persuade her friends and relatives that I was the one who had cheated on her. This was never true. She has urged me to take her back after the divorce. I either don't answer or change the conversation, but every time she makes that offer, it's like it's D-Day all over again. I do my best to forgive her since I believe she has underlying mental disorders that lead to her conduct. That's because, before I met her, she was engaged to a man who was ready to enter medical school, and he called it quits after discovering her cheating. I can forgive those who want to murder me on a daily basis, but I cannot and will never forgive her for what she has done to my children. Believe it or not, I've only touched on the high spots, but I'm hoping that reading this and knowing there is light at the end of the tunnel may assist someone who is going through the same thing right now.